Does the Bible condone child marriage? Yes. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah, actually it does. And it's weird that God gave 600 plus laws, and some of those were silly, like not eating shellfish, not mixing fabric, or mixing seeds, yet he couldn't just say, don't marry children? Strange to me. In the book of Numbers, chapter 31, God is seeking revenge on the Midianites. And so he sends Moses and the Israelites to go and attack the Midianites and to execute all of them. So nowhere in this passage does God say to kill all of them. Fair enough. This particular passage doesn't explicitly state that God said to execute every living thing. But I think there is a good precedent for it elsewhere in the Bible, which we could apply to this particular passage. Not that we need to. This is actually a distraction from the main point, so I'm only going to touch on it briefly. One of the primary reasons why God wants all of the Canaanites and the Jebusites, so on and so forth, to be completely wiped out is because he doesn't want them to teach the Israelites to practice idolatry. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 13, we'll start in verse 12, if you hear it said about one of the towns that the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that the scoundrels from among you have gone out and led the inhabitants of the town astray, saying, let us go and serve other gods whom you have not known, then you shall inquire and make a thorough investigation. If the charge is established that such an abhorrent thing has been done among you, you shall put the inhabitants of that town to the sword, utterly destroying it and everything in it, even putting the livestock to the sword. So among the towns where they're settling, which is not Midian, of course, but among the towns where they're settling, if somebody teaches the Israelites to practice idolatry, you must unalive all of the inhabitants. And for towns that are in the land of Canaan, you're supposed to unalive all the inhabitants anyways, which it says in Deuteronomy chapter 20, and it gives you to reason why. If you go to verse uh, 16, we'll start there. But as for the towns of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. Indeed, you shall annihilate them, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, all that the Lord your God has commanded you. And why would you want to do all this? So that they may not teach you to do the abhorrent things that they do for their gods and thus uh, sin against the Lord your God. So God is saying you must utterly annihilate these people so they don't lead you into idolatry. And if you remember, Numbers 31, that is what God is punishing the Midianites for. He's punishing them for leading the Israelites into idolatrous practices. We also have a really clear precedent in uh, 1 Samuel 15, 3 of God avenging the Israelites against a particular city, that's uh, the Amalekites, and they didn't even fall into idolatrous practices. God is just mad at the city, and he says, uh, Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did in opposing the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but unalive both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So we've got very clear precedents when God wants to avenge himself or the Israelites against a particular people group. It's very common for him to say, unalive all of them, every living thing. I also just think it's unrealistic that Moses would be upset with the Israelites for not executing the women unless God had set that expectation for him. It actually doesn't make sense to me that Moses would be more bloodthirsty than the God of the Bible, because elsewhere in the Bible we find humans being much more humanitarian towards others than the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is usually the bloodthirsty one. And so Moses explicitly tells them, these young little virgin girls, you can keep them alive for yourself, but all the little boys, execute them. All the women who aren't virgins, execute them. So this is immoral, but it should be noted God never approves of this. And finally, this is the meat and potatoes of our discussion, whether or not something immoral was going on. And you must be referring to the little virgin girls being taken as plunder and war brides, not the little boys being executed, because little boys are commanded to be executed in war all the time. This, In fact, God does it himself sometimes, so this is not a problem. But was God involved in this decision? Can we blame just Moses for this? No. Verse 25 explicitly says that God has blamed too. Let's read it. In verse 25, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You and Eleazar the priest and the heads of the ancestral houses of the congregation make an inventory of the plunder captured, both human and animal. Divide the plunder into two parts, between the warriors who went out to battle and all the congregation. So God is saying, All these little virgin girls that you kept, go ahead and divide them among the warriors just like Moses said prior. So God spoke into the situation here. He could have said, hey, adopt these little children as your, uh, as your own household members. He could have said, give them all to the, the service of the Lord. He could have said, 
uh, unalive all of them like you did the little boy. But he didn't say any of those things. He said divide them among the warriors. But it's actually the most practical thing to do here if you're not going to execute them. Let me explain why this whole divide them among the people for war brides actually happened. Because if you keep reading, there were a ton of them. It says the plunder remaining from the spoils that the troops had taken totaled 675,000 sheep, 72,000 oxen, 61,000 donkeys, and 32,000 persons in all women who had not known a man by sleeping with them. So there were quite literally 32,000 little virgin girls. So they either had to execute them or do something else with them. And obviously both Moses and God said, well, I guess we're just going to make them our war brides. And by the way, I do appreciate that we're not having a discussion here about what happened to these little girls because half of these apologetic discussions are people claiming that they didn't get turned into war brides, but they most certainly did. These were not children that Moses had adopted. In fact, if that were true, they wouldn't have been divided among the warriors. They would have been divided among the families, most specifically among the women of Israel, not among the warriors. The Bible often narrates the sins of the patriarchs without telling us that it was sinful in God's eyes. For example, Noah was never condemned for his drunkenness. Abraham was never condemned for what he did to Sarah. Lot was never condemned for what he did to his daughters. Judah was never condemned for his actions with Tamar. And likewise, Moses was also immoral and did sinful things. Well, I think it's a bit of a red herring to insist that just because some of God's chosen people in the Bible did things that were unsavory and God let it pass, that this is one of those occasions. That's yet to be seen because, as we just read, God was involved. In fact, he weighed in and he was in the mix, and his judgment as to what should be done seemed to be in line with what Moses wanted to do. God had every opportunity to change the course of paths, and he didn't. He decided to continue on that course. But it's also weird that God does punish people in the Bible, sometimes harshly for even minor infractions. For example, Onan's brother. We don't even know why God took Onan. And Onan himself was executed by God for merely not fulfilling his levirate duties. And what about the guy who was carrying the Ark of the Covenant in transport and and fell over, lost his balance, touched it, and God executed him? What about uh, Nadab and Abby, who who were executed uh, by God for entering drunk into the Holy and Holies? Uh, What about also the man in the Book of Numbers who was picking up sticks on the Sabbath, didn't even know he was breaking the Sabbath, most likely? That's why they had to take him to Moses, and Moses had to inquire of the Lord, and God said, go ahead and execute the guy. God is perfectly okay with giving harsh, harsh penalties against people for even minor infractions. Yet here, when Moses does something completely terrible, taking 32,000 little girls and marrying them off as war brides, God's like, eh, go ahead, get her done. But it says that God waited a period after puberty before she was ready for lovemaking. From this example, we can see that God suggests lovemaking should only occur after puberty, not before or during. I don't think you realize it, but this actually makes your position look worse. Just saying that these girls may have actually reached puberty before God and Moses had them married off as war brides doesn't make it any better. Even if they are children, let's say they're children that hit puberty at age 11, 12, or 13 or something of that nature, does it make them marriageable? That's ridiculous. In fact, when I insist that Mary was probably 13 when she was married off because the proto-evangelism of James says so, people lose their utter minds when I make that suggestion and saying that God certainly wouldn't have done such a thing to Mary. Yet, when we talk about uh, these little virgin girls from Numbers 31, people are like, well, as long as they hit puberty, it's okay. What? What kind of a double standard is that? And it's also irrelevant, because these weren't people that someone was entering into marriage in some sort of a traditional marriage agreement, like what is described in the passage that you're reading. These are booty, spoils of war. These are just essentially objects of spoil, and God says in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that you can enjoy the spoils of war. They're for you. 